Hello. Um, I'll start slowly. I'm also trying to gain some time because I'm finishing to train some models and takes a bit. Uh, what we can do is start the uh, and start the course and hopefully by the time the model ends, we get to showing the results. Um, okay, so oh no, I am saying it's training, so you can't see the slides. So I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll bring the PowerPoint slides and then we can switch later. Uh, let me see if I do this. I guess you see them. Uh, today, we, we delve into these two topics, recurrent neural networks for language modeling, and then attention and transformer. And uh, especially the last one, transformer, is um, arguably the state of the art in uh, language modeling nowadays. Before that, maybe I can ask if you have any questions regarding the first two lessons. Um, if not, we can move on. OK, so that's where we have been so far. We started by, as I, OK, so we, we had a look at what language models are, which is essentially the idea to calculate probabilities of words given a context. We started by looking into n grams, which is the simplest approach based on frequencies. It basically creates models that more or less are, that there's no training there. It's not really machine learning. Um, and there are models that, however, are very explainable uh, because they basically memorize text quite well. Last lesson was on uh, feed forward neural networks and uh, one specific work which was made by Benjo in 2003 which introduced this idea of uh, word embeddings, or at that time, uh, he called it uh, feature vectors, shared feature vectors. And from there, we looked into word embeddings. Um, and we saw a few algorithms, name, most, most importantly, we looked into word to vec which opened, to me, it opened the gates to this whole brand of uh, uh, research into self-supervised learning to generate word embeddings. And from there, I, we also got to document embeddings and so on. So today we continue and we look into recurrent networks. Before doing that, let's have a look at some issues that the previous approaches had, mainly n-grounds and fit forward neural networks. But the, the main thing is that these two approaches rely on a, on a fixed context, context size, a fixed history. And we saw with the n-grams, the, the more we increase n, the, the more um, realistic the text was generated. Uh, we haven't seen it with Benjo Neural Network, but you can play with an old book and you can, you can play by increasing the, the, the size of the history. And then you, you can see what, what that, how that affects the creation of, uh, of text and the calculation of probabilities. Nonetheless, it's kind of realistic to imagine that natural language is based on a fixed window, like the context as, as on a, a fixed window. If you think about it, I'm, I'm also referring to things that, that were mentioned in the first lesson, which was two weeks ago. So imagine I, I had to record all my words from two weeks till now. So then when I say engram, you know what I'm referring to. So this is a bit of a problem. So fixed context is problematic. So researchers have tried to, to come up with solutions and a main one with respect to, to neural uh, neural networks was the definition or the, the, the invention of recurrent neural networks. In essence, a recurrent neural network is any, any network that contains a cycle and basically means that the value of some of its units is dependent on its own earlier outputs. Um, through neural net, through recurrent neural networks, or thanks to recurrent neural networks, um, there is no longer a need to to present sequences uh, to, to to be modeled or processed. Um, but instead, it is then possible to present 
one word at a time, one item at a time, because this very fact that there is a loop, there is a cycle in which previous information is being fed back, the network has a sort of memory. Ideally, the network remembers something from the past and, uh, and it can leverage it. One of the simplest networks is the Elman network. Um, we are going to delve a bit into it to have an idea on how this cycle is being implemented. Elman networks or neural ne most of the neural networks take an input, uh, a vector X, and uh, another vector, which in this case, it, it's basically the information that is being fed back. And uh, it's called a state sometimes. This state is another vector. And you can see we are at time t, present an item at time t, a word, you can imagine, and, uh, and a state. So some information about the past. And uh, you can imagine that if we talk about the first word, then we need to, to initialize this state ad hoc. We can set it to zero. We can set random values. We can, we can play with it. And what we expect in output is something that the network should, should predict. And at the, the next state, the state at, uh, at times t. So then when we get to t plus one, we fit in x t plus one, the, the state at times t, and then we get y t plus one and h t plus one. Inside we have the usual linear combination. So we have our weights that, that, that operate on the input and on the state. Then this information is being summed together in the Elman network to, to obtain a vector. This vector goes through a nonlinearity. In this case, is the arc tangent, and this, the output of this uh, nonlinearity is the state at time t. This is one of the outputs because then the state is further processed with another matrix um, multiplication. Another nonlinearity in that case is the sigmoidal activation, and that's how uh, the Elman network generates the output. Now, if we go away from generic neural networks and look into language modeling, one important work was made by Mikolov in 2010. The paper is called RNN Based Language Model. I also uploaded it in the reading material in the repository together with other papers. So please have a look at it. It's a very nice paper. And uh, his implementation is essentially an Elman network with bits that come from Benjo's work. Uh, specifically, he uh, relied on the idea of the shared feature, so the word embeddings, essentially. So uh, if you remember, Benjo's work uh, had a lookup table uh, in which had as many rows as the vocabulary and, uh, and as many columns as the size of these vectors, these embeddings. And the same happens in this, uh, this network architecture. So when we feed in a word, this, this embedding is being taken, is being combined, concatenated in this case with the previous state. And then the same operation that we saw previously with the Elman network occurs. So that there is a, a linear combination with a linear um, multiplication with the matrix. Then there's a nonlinearity. In that case, Mikolov implemented the sigmoidal activation. And then the, the hidden state is, uh, sorry, what the state, sorry, is generated. Told you about the temperature is, is rising a bit. Then there is another matrix multiplication. And then uh, softmax is being applied to predict the next word. Now, um, we talk about language modeling. So we want to predict the probability of a word or predict the next word given a context. So that means that this network has as many output neurons as the size of the, of the vocabulary. So the softmax operation converts this, uh, transforms these output neurons into a probability distribution. We can go and look into the code if we finish training. Let me see. Oh, yes. OK, so we can. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we went through this. We went through this. We went through this. OK, so we are back to our recipes. You remember them. Uh, it's a data set of 10,000 recipes. They were minimally cleaned. Everything is lower caps. I removed numbers and inserted this token. Each uh, instruction has an additional token at the end called new line that I introduced. And uh, so then we can, we can split the recipe into instructions. And, uh, and then there, there's a bit of information that I want to give you. Uh, I run a little exploratory analysis of this data set. And uh, it turns out that each 
instruction in, uh, in, in across the, the whole 10,000 recipes as on average six words plus minus four uh, standard deviation. So take into account the sequence length of 11. This is, let's say, the, most of the, the instructions have up to 11 words. Now, I mentioned that because to train these recurrent neural networks, we need a batch. And uh, as you remember from the previous class, so this batch has size 512. That, that's across all the other trainings that, that I made um, in the course. And, and it's composed of 11 words. So that's the sequence size. The data that is being provided to, to the neural network to train is a sequence of 11 words. So this is the input. And what we expect is that the network uh, outputs this, predicts these words. So basically, and then these are the indices in the vocabulary. So that means that first we provide S to the network and we expect the network to predict in. Then there is the, the, the state that is being saved. And then we provide in. The network has the previous state, takes in and should predict A and so on and so on. One word at a time, as I said earlier. Now there is one thing to take into account because we talk about training. So imagine, I don't know, we present heavy, we expect num as prediction, but imagine that the network instead of heavy predicts brown as the word that, that should follow. Um, when we bring the next word to train, well, we, we, we correct the network, let's say. We don't let the network think, okay, brown is correct. So it should be heavy brown word but we correct it to num. So this is, it's called teach and for, teacher forcing. So we, we correct the network so that the network keeps getting uh, the correct examples to, to train upon. Um, I trained the network, as I said, when we started the, the, the lesson. And now let's see if we can generate some text. Yes, it doesn't crash. So this is an example of what the network generated. Um, you can see here we have the usual Suspect the temperature and top K, not top P, but you know that the difference from last lesson. And this is what uh, the network generates. Of course, the network is not perfect. You can see in here this instruction, I don't know what that means. Uh, blend sour cream with what? I don't know. Uh, keep in mind that for these examples, the network has been trained only for five epochs. And uh, it's the simplest network, it's that RNN network from Mikolov. Um, of course, you can uh, you can play with the hyperparameters. You can even stack additional layers, uh, recurrent layers, to get a bit more, um, let's say, sophisticated language models. So far, so good. Okay. Now, um, in theory, recurrent neural networks can learn very long-term dependencies. Because of this loop, we have the state. So in theory, uh, if you think about it, we can provide, you know, in this case, we provide sequences of, of uh, uh, 11 words, but nobody forbids us to, to give, you know, the full 10,000 recipes with all the words. In practice, these recurrent neural networks don't really learn very long-term dependencies. And that's because uh, there is um, a fundamental problem, especially with the recurrent neural networks, which is called the vanishing exploding gradient. But you know, you remember from last lesson that we talked about gradient descent and the idea of gradient descent as, as the, the core algorithm to, to nowadays deep learning is to, 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 to calculate uh, the loss, the prediction loss of a model, then extract the derivative, the gradient of that loss, and then move along the negative gradient of that loss. So then there is a parameter adjustment. In that way, uh, it is expected that at the next iteration, the next epoch, for instance, the loss is being reduced. Uh, vanishing gradient essentially means that if a network is very big, the this gradient, you, you know, a network, I showed you earlier with the, the Elman network on purpose, it was already composed by several matrices and nonlinearities. If you make a network very, very big, if you stack layers, for instance, or recurrent layers, then you end up uh, having a gradient that is being calculated from functions. There are functions of other functions of other functions of other functions. So that the gradient gets very, very small. That means that when it's time to, to calculate the weight adjustment for the early layers of a neural network, 
these changes are so minimal that basically these weights don't change. And that's the term vanishing. So the gradient at the early layers of, uh, of the, 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 the gradient of the error for the early layers is essentially zero. So the, the network doesn't adjust those weights. So if you think about it, we have word embeddings at the initial layer for recurrent neural networks. So the network doesn't learn any embeddings. If it doesn't learn any embeddings, it doesn't have any information of what to, how to represent words. So how can it learn to, to model a language? There's the other counterpart, which is the exploding gradient. And it has been shown empirically that uh, it can also happen that these gradients explode. They get extremely large. And when they're extremely large, when the gradient is, is very large, it means that the weight adjustment is very big. And that means that the, the network, the, the changes in the parameters make the network sort of oscillate in performance and uh, it can stabilize itself. And then basically the network doesn't learn because it's not possible to understand when the network, uh, when the parameters converge and then the training is, uh, is finished. Now, you, you might think that these recurrent neural networks are essentially simple because there were, I suppose, three matrices and two nonlinearities. But there is, a, there is one, one caveat, and that's basically the fact that um, recurrent neural networks can be unrolled. That means that instead of representing the loop, we can, um, yeah, we, we can represent it in this way. So you can imagine that the weights are the same inside all these boxes. It's the same matrices, the same parameters of the same neural network, but when it's time, let's say we're at time t, and we, we calculate the error that the network um, made at time t, we need to back propagate, uh, we need to calculate the error to go back until h0, time one, essentially, because what the network computed at time t also depends on time one, because there was the history. So you can see that even if the, the neural network that we implemented is very small, relatively small in terms of parameters, the way it's being uh, used, the way since it manages infinite sequence, infinite history, if you want, it in fact makes the network extremely big. And that's why it suffers from these vanishing and exploding gradient issues. Um, there has been a lot of, of research in trying to improve recurrent neural networks because even if they suffer from these issues, they are nonetheless quite important. They are uh, used a lot also in time series analysis, for instance. And also, uh, until the transformer uh, the revolution that we talk later, recurrent neural networks were also used in, in uh, video analysis, for instance, because they have this temporal feature. Uh, I guess one of the main uh, contributions to the improvement of recurrent neural networks was the long short term memory network. This is this architecture was proposed in 1997. And this type of network and, and other flavors of, of this type are called gated neural networks. And by gates, I mean that there are some, um, yeah, in, engineered connections inside the, the, the network itself that work as gates. So they, they, they act as filters. They, these gates decide what to keep and what to discard. And by, in theory, by being able to, to discard some stuff, to learn to forget, let's say, um, then the, these long-term dependencies can be selectively kept. And then in theory, the, these gradients, uh, or let's say the training of these networks is, um, is improved and these networks are a bit more performing that, than the simple recurrent neural networks. Uh, let me see what time it is. Maybe we can go through it very quickly. Um, anybody against that? All right, so let's see very quickly. Oh no, <laughs> wait a bit. There was the, I, I found the details of the, oh no, yeah, wait, sorry. I trained the LSTM and this is what the LSTM generates. Now, of course you don't remember what the RNN generated. This is a, a generated um, recipe. I can see this is a very, very long sentence. I don't know if it really makes sense. First sentence doesn't really make any sense. But again, it was trained with five epochs uh, with the same hyperparameters, essentially. So immediately, I jars, I guess should have learned to say in jars, maybe, but. But anyway, you can play with it a bit. 
uh, and, and experiment yourself. Um, let's go very quickly inside this idea of the gates. Uh, that the main thing that LSTM bring to, to the scene is that there are two vectors. Uh, one is C, that it's the context, if I'm not mistaken, together with the state. Uh, the context is basically like a buffer that, that keeps all the information from the past, let's say. And there are these two gates. One is the forget gate, which we get there now. And the forget gate, essentially takes information from the previous state and the current input, combines it with, the, with this linear uh, combination, the bias. And then there is a sigmoidal activation. And this sigmoid is the gate because this result, you remember the sigmoid uh, generates values between zero and one. And, uh, and when this is multiplied with the context vector, essentially, if there is a zero, um, the, the gate suggests to forget that piece of information. When there is a one, it means keep that information. Then we have the input gate that takes an input again, the, the state and the input vector uh, performs two, there are two paths. One is uh, following with same, same uh, calculations actually from, from the, the forget gate. And the second one, which has a, uh, um, arc tangent activation function. And the output of this path is a candidate context. Then this is multiplied together with the IT to decide which parts of the candidate context should be kept or should be discarded. And then this is summed to the current context. So basically in this bit, in the first bit, again, uh, the network decides what to forget. And in the second bit, in the second gate, the network decides what new information should be kept. Remember, however, that what comes from here has information kept in the, in the state. So the same information that comes back in time, which is the same as the context. And then we have the output calculation, which is once again, the same combination that we see here of the, the, heat, the, the state, the input, and the sigmoidal activation function. Uh, this is combined with the, the context via um, an, an arc tangent activation function. And, uh, and this results into this uh, output. Turns out that the output is the, the output and the state is the same. Now, let's move on. Um, and let's talk about encoder decoder architectures. What are encoder decoder architecture? Essentially, is uh, it's also known as sequence to sequence, and the idea is that we have recurrent neural networks that, that process some input, and that's the encoder bit, and uh, the output of that encoder is being fed to another recurrent neural network called the decoder that provides an output, and uh, this type of architecture is used a lot in uh, machine translation and text summarization. How this is done? Well, the an important paper, uh, I think it's the paper that introduced encoder-decoder architectures is from 2014 by Cho. Again, the paper is on, uh, is on the reading material. They introduced a new, uh, I think Benji is in there. They introduced a new recurrent neural network architecture, architecture called uh, gated recurrent unit. The sort of, I think it combines the, um, the, the input gate and the output calculation of LSTM into a unique update gate. And essentially, in their work, they, they take a sequence, they fit it to a GRU uh, network. The network keeps processing, let's say compressing all the sequence, the whole sequence, until the last stage at type T. The, um, the output of this network, it's called the context in this case, is what is being fed to the decoder architecture. The decoder architecture then starts generating words. And at each step that it generates the word, this decoder takes an input, the previously generated word, and the same context for the encoder. So you can imagine in machine translation that we have a sentence written in, uh, in English, and there is a recurrent neural network that generates a vector 
of this sentence that is being fed to a decoder architecture, decoder network, that keep, starts generating, I don't know, French words by taking into account the full English sentence, so encoding into this context, and what the network has been generated thus far. There is, however, uh, a problem with, the, with this architecture, and you can see it in this diagram. Essentially, uh, only this context, the last hidden state of the whole sequence is being sent to the decoder. So there's a lot of information compressed in this context. And we get essentially the same issues that we saw earlier with the recurrent neural network, that if the sequence is very long, how can we ensure when it's time to, to, to translate, for instance, that the information regarding the first word is being taken into account in a, in a good way. And again, in fact, this architecture suffered from very long sequences. One major breakthrough came with the, um, this technique called attention, which was presented by, I don't know how to pronounce it, Bad Danau and others. At all, it's always very easy to pronounce. Um, was presented in this paper, Neural Machine Translation by Johnny Learning to Align and Translate, 2015. Once again, the paper is in the reading material, I'll read it because again, it's brilliant, I should stop saying that. And, um, and they define align and translate. So alignment is the problem in machine translation that identifies which parts of the input sequence are relevant to each word in the output. So more or less is what we had thus far in the, in the previous paper. So we have this input sequence and we understand which part are relevant. We need to find that bit. And then we have translation, which is the process of using the relevant information to select the, the appropriate output. So in, in a sense, they, um, they decouple the two things from uh, what was being done before. It's an encoder-decoder architecture. So let's have a look into it and how attention is being implemented. So let's start from the encoder. The encoder is this bit. What they implemented is a, a so-called bidirectional recurrent neural network. It's essentially two networks, two neural networks, that process the, the input sequence in two directions, from the first word to the last one, and from the last one to the first one. And, uh, and this is represented by these hidden states. You can see with the arrow. And, um, and what is, uh, is done in this work is instead of focusing on one single context that is being passed to the decoder, all of these hidden states are being given to the decoder. And these are called annotations in their work. So I can see that H1, so the annotation for the first word, is, is basically the hidden state of that word from left to right and right to left. Now we get to the decoder, and I'm following what the paper said. So I, I was wondering whether I should flip it, but I, I think this is, the, I, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't come up with an alternative. Uh, way. So read the paper if you get confused or ask questions. But the decoder architecture is again a recurrent neural network. So the idea is to generate a word given previous words and the, uh, the input of the decoder. And this is defined as a function uh, of the previous word, S and C. S is the hidden state for time i for that recurrent neural network. So again, the decoder is a recurrent neural network. So um, it relies on the previous state, S i minus one, they use i instead of t this time, the previous word being generated, and C i. C i is the context vector C i for each target word Y i. So it's not the context vector of the input, but the context vector of the output. This context is calculated each, at each time stem, and it's calculated as a weighted sum of the annotations of all x words and a parameter alpha. This parameter alpha is a softmax function of some other parameter called e. e is a function of the recurring the decoder's last state and the, um, the annotation J, so because you know we have uh, all the input 
uh, j is a, is a go ranging across all the x words. And this a is a fit for a neural network. So I'll go through it once again. But this, this a is what is called an alignment model. So basically, this encoder decoder has a bidirectional recurrent neural network at the bottom, recurrent neural network in the decoder, and a, a feed forward neural network. This feed forward neural network takes in input the annotations from the, the, uh, the encoder and the, um, the hidden states of the decoder. And um, by doing this, um, what, what happens is that at each time when uh, it is possible to calculate, to, to, to generate different contexts for different words that need to be generated by the decoder. So far so good? I assume so. Um, what that means, and this is, an, this is a visualization that they presented in their paper, is that we have an input sentence, which was in English, and the output was in French. I think it was English to French. And, and this attention mechanism, this neural network that, let, let me show uh, again, uh, or better here, like we have, we have the soft marks. Um, so it's probably distribution. This, this attention mechanism allows the network, the decoder, that has to generate French, for instance, let's say, uh, given the word signed, the network can, um, sorry, it has to generate signs, so we have to go in this way. Uh, the network can focus on the previous words. So in this case, I think we talk about, it's the wrong example, but you have an idea. So attention essentially allows the network to focus on, or let's say, yeah, attend certain words from the input sequence. And, uh, and of course, by taking into account what has been generated yet, then the translation is much more efficient. I messed it up a bit, but uh, let's say I'm ill, but we can, uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, this is a, a quote that I took from their paper because um, until this point, I think in the paper, the term attention was never mentioned. And, um, and that's how it was introduced. They say that by letting the decoder have an attention mechanism, they relieve the encoder from the burden of having to encode all information into a fixed length vector. And um, and this is a key key aspect of it. So it, it allows the, this attention also to change so that there's no longer a fixed piece of information. There's not such compression into one unique vector. And, uh, and in fact, it says that, that the context is generated at each step. Now, uh, for the sake of completeness, you can see an example. I, I trained the net in the, the notebook. You will find the code that, that trained uh, a GRU network to generate text. So you can generate recipes. So pour half well one side. So the other one, do which one? Uh, mix cake. I, li I like these recipes. Um, but again, it was five epochs. Um, anyway, let's move on because now that. Um, in 2015, attention was introduced. A lot of work sprouted on that topic. And, um, and especially it started focusing on the weaknesses of this encoder decoder models, especially on, on the, the recurrent neural network aspects of it. And the main problem is that um, it was around 2015, as, as you show, as you saw earlier, and um you know, in, in the last years, we saw an explosion of GPU training and cloud computing and all these things, which uh, exploit parallelization of computation to make, you know, uh, calculations much faster. And with the recurrent neural networks, there are some issues with parallelization because we, we deal with sequences one word at a time. So things have to be kept together, let's say, in, we don't want to get into computer architectures, but um, trust me. Um, and nonetheless, these encoder decoder models, although they have this attention mechanism, they, they didn't really solve uh, sequence to sequence modeling fully. So um, we get to 20, 2017 and a paper called Attention is All You Need sort of 
uh, was the beginning of the disruption of NLP because a new architecture called the transformer with uh, a so-called self-attention mechanism was introduced. Again, this paper is, is in the reading materials. Um, there is one bit that I want to highlight here that we will talk about it next lesson. Please come next lesson because I think it's the best one. Um, it said the transformer was trained for as little as 12 hours on eight P100 GPUs. I don't know what the P100 is, but it's eight GPUs for 12 hours. So as little as, I don't know. I don't know if it is little, but I'm sure there's a lot of electricity being generated or consumed to train this, this very small transformer architecture. Um, as I said, transformers sort of disrupted NLP and uh, and self especially transform the self attention mechanism has been started being applied beyond NLP. So we start having computer vision relying on self attention. There are some works out there that say that convolutional neural networks are going are doomed because self attention will uh, will will take over. Uh, now we also have uh, I think. Um, time series analysis is, is made on self-attention. And uh, so it's um, it's quite a big invention, let's say, in, uh, in machine learning. How does it work? Well, if I confused a bit with attention, let's try to confuse a bit more with self-attention. Uh, the architecture is an encoder-decoder uh, architecture. The encoder is on the left and the decoder is on the right. And the idea, again, is that we have an input and the output is some probabilities, some words, and uh, we can use this for machine translation, for instance, we can use it for standard language modeling and, uh, and so on. Uh, I think I forgot to mention, but maybe I'll, I'll have it later in the slides. Um, so I'm not gonna say now in case I'll say later, I mean, in case for sure we'll say later. Uh, the idea is that um, we have the usual embedding. So we, we, we bring in input some words, we have the, the, the word embedding bit, there's one part called positional encoding. Actually, I should mention it now, but basically the main thing that the transformer uh, contributed to is that the transformer architecture is not a recurrent neural network. It's a forward neural network. It's a huge one. Um, there's no recurrent structure. And, um, and that allowed for, I guess, that may actually it's idea, but, but basically because it's a forward neural network, it is possible to leverage GPUs and, uh, and, and, and leverage parallelism and so on. And, and also thanks to self-attention. Anyway, um, what happens, however, is that if you, if you remember, the, the forward neural network from Benjo had uh, a fixed context. So it was possible to know that, I don't know, the first input neuron was the second to last word to what we want to predict the second, Input neuron is the last word, and so on. With the with the, the transformer, because we parallelize, we do everything. The thing is a bit problematic because uh, they also went beyond this idea of a limited context. So what they introduced is a so-called positional encoding, which is basically a function. It's a trigonometric function. In, in their paper, they combine the sine and cosine function to basically um, generate values that represent the order of the word in the text. And by doing that, they allow the network to maintain the temporal structure of the sequence. The main bit, the main contribution is the multi-head attention, or then it's all, then it becomes known as self-attention. And um, it basically splits the input word uh, or the input sequence into three representations, key, value, and query through linear uh, manipulation, li linear combinations. Then there is a scale dot product, product attention, I'll show you later. Um, there are a number of these self-attention um, modules that should allow the network uh, to focus on different parts of the sequence. Multi-head in theory means that each head should suggest the network to attend different parts of the sequence. It's a bit like if you want in convolutional neural networks that we have different filters that should so that, that focus on different 
graphical patterns in an input image. So it's the same more or less of uh, multi-head attention. Uh, then what we have is that uh, you can see here there are a few neural networks and um, and things get uh, combined. Now the uh, scale dot product attention is implemented as follows. It's basically a bunch of matrix manipulations with softmax. This is the formula. They basically combine the three different representation of uh, the sequence in a, uh, a query key and value um, so that again we uh, the network can implement this self-attention mechanism so basically when we when we provide an input sequence uh, no matter how big it is the transformer can uh, relate in theory should relate each word to some relevant ones in the remaining part of the sequence and the transformer has a stack of these encoders and decoders. In the original paper, there were six. It's not really a magic number. You can put as many as you want, but in their paper, they put six. So basically, the transformer is a stack of encoders, so uh, a stack of multi-head attention with feed for neural network that is then passed to another multi-head attention, feed for neural network, and so on. The output is then given to the decoder that takes an input at this at the middle stage uh, takes an input what the decoder generated, what the, the decoder generated in the previous step comes from here, so from the, uh, the output of the previous step, and then again generates, um, it, it leads to a probability distribution over the vocabulary, and the, the thing continues. Um, I wrote some code implementing the transformer. Uh, it's based on this tutorial on uh, PyTorch. Uh, and this is the generated sentence. Now let, let's try to get a big one. Let's see if they make more sense. Again, it was for five epochs. Temperature is a bit big. So let's try to give it a bit more credit transformer. Mix all ingredients. Uh, if, if you read them, maybe they make a bit more sense. Maybe not this one. Sprinkle with butter. And uh, anyway, you can play with it a bit and, uh, and have an idea. Now, one, uh, one last big thing that I want to mention is the issue with the computing performance. So uh, this is a plot. Uh, in the last days, I tried to run these models uh, in a fair condition. So basically, I was rebooting my machine and training a neural network and then saving how long a single training epoch took, it's only about five epochs anyway. And I took also the number of parameters. So I tried to generate, uh, to, to implement networks that which number of parameters is relatively comparable and you can see it on the side. So the transformer is the biggest model, whereas the RNN and uh, Benjo's network from the previous le lesson are the smallest ones, of them, but we talk about thousands of parameters. So from 218,000 to 223,000, some sort of comparable. They all have the same word embedding size. So that, that's the other important thing. So they're being compared fairly, I would say. And uh, since I was running each training um, after a fresh start of a laptop, I hope the machine was fresh in all of these independent runs. And you can see here the computing time of each epoch. And uh, you can see here that the, the transformer, being even the biggest model, took the least amount of time to train. And that's because, again, it's a free for neural network that relies heavily on GPU acceleration. The second quickest one is Benjo's network, another fit for neural network, uh, although it's very, very small. And those that, that, that need more time are the recurrent neural network. So this is also a way to show that recurrent neural networks not only suffer from uh, long sequences and keeping the dependencies of long sequences, but they also uh, require more uh, time to train. Now, to conclude, we, we look a bit into recurrent neural networks. Uh, we delved a bit into LSTM as well. Uh, and then from there, we probably went a bit too fast, sorry about that, from uh, from encoder decoder models to attention, self attention, transformer, and uh, and we had a glimpse on on how transformer improve 
uh, language modeling in terms of computation and uh, and, and hopefully also in, in the in the modeling itself. If you want some references, um, this is uh, a very nice um, page that explains LSTMs. Uh, part of the content that was taken from these chapters in the Juravsky Martin turns out that I misspelled that surname throughout the, the whole course. I'll just keep it like that, probably. It's a bit disrespectful, so maybe I'll change it. Uh, these are all the papers that are present in the reading material. I think I added some others. And uh, if you want to have a look at uh, the transformer neural network that I might have confused you, this is an 18-minute video that goes very well into the details. And above, it's the, the related blog post. And this is it. OK, then thank you and see you next time. Thank you.